Hello and welcome to Essential Implementation. My name is Christian Hudson and I'm an implementation specialist based at the Improvement Academy in Yorkshire, United Kingdom. Over the past 20 years, implementation science has given us a whole range of implementation theories, models and frameworks which we can use to help us implement things into healthcare settings. One of the most cited implementation frameworks is the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFA for short, which gives us five domains and 38 implementation constructs, which we can use and apply when trying to ensure implementation success. But how useful is that? Does knowing these things about a setting then lead to change? And what about sustaining interventions over time? I asked these questions to Laura Damschroeder, the first author and developer of the CIFA framework, to see what she had to say. Laura Damschroeder, thank you for joining us today on Essential Implementation. Unlike, say, some of the behavioral modification type framework, this one is more eclectic, isn't it? There's five domains that cover not just the individuals, but covers the, the organization inside and outside. So the CIFR was really born out of a desire to provide a more precise language around when we talk about leadership engagement, for example, what do we mean, what does it include, and what does it exclude? So what we attempted to do with the CIFR is to create a one-stop shop where people could go to a list of constructs, of theoretical concepts. It really provided the language that people could now speak and give even practitioners the language for things that really resonate with them. It does resonate with them. I've, I've seen that firsthand. Now, this, this idea of practicality, I mean, th there was a paper by, by somebody called Fazy in 2018, which, which really resonated with me because he was saying that on the one hand, we have a lot of academic uh, knowledge about implementation and we have a an idea about what factors may affect it, but we're not, we're still perhaps not sure how to actually do it. And how yeah. do we find that out? You know, we have kind of a meta theory, like a driving theory um, in implementation research that says that we need to understand and articulate and kind of diagnose our context in which we're attempting implementation. And then knowing that context, we can tailor and adapt implementation strategies to then help either overcome or reduce barriers or amplify facilitators to enable successful implementation. But what I've experienced, you know, as, a re as an implementation researcher and as someone who has attempted to implement programs in lots of different settings, is that as implementation researchers, I might diet come in from the outside as an implementation researcher and I might diagnose a local context. So like your context mm. in your clinical setting. And then I may see, okay, leadership engagement, may be an issue. You know, I've learned this from other settings that it really is an important uh, construct to address. Uh, maybe resources, maybe priority. And so if people are not using data, for example, to help monitor progress of their implementation, then we might say, well, an implementation strategy to address that might be audit and provide feedback. So basically provide that data for teams in an accessible, usable, actionable way. Well, that's kind of a macro level strategy. So I, as an implementation researcher, may develop an audit and feedback strategy that is adapted and modified and kind of tailored to that specific problem. Mm. Um, but then when I actually go to your clinic, there are what I would call a dozen, dozens of micro strategies that you need to do to actually make that audit and feedback strategy effective. So for example, you need to form a coalition. That's a strategy. You need to facilitate people being able to implement. That's a stra another strategy. You need to um, plan and uh, assess your own barriers and facilitators that are unique to you and your setting. That's another strategy. 
and it goes on and on. So we even, you know, at a high level as implementation researchers, we may identify that everyone can benefit from audit and feedback, but at a micro level, at a specific context level, people are going to use that audit and feedback in different ways that best fits with their environment. Am I right in thinking that involving people in these settings in that that process is, is important. If it was a nurse on a ward, is she more likely to know uh, what those might be? Or yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, she's the one that has to navigate her own local setting and identify, you know, if we say that leadership engagement is important and here are some strategies for, you know, maybe it's an education strategy, maybe it's a coalition building strategy. Mm-hmm. She's the one that has to know or figure out, well, which which leaders? How exactly do I package this education? And which people are the key people for me to involve in this effort? That nurse, those physicians, those technicians, they're the experts in their own context. And they're the ones that should be, need to be leading the way. And I'm here to help them. But that also means that I have to operate on their timeline. So if it takes a year to get a new staff on board that is essential for this implementation, we've just lost a year. And that is devastating for me as a researcher because it's blown my timeline, right? Um, And so we may tend to go more toward the make it happen. Like, for example, we may hire staff who, you know, research staff who actually go in and help do it. Um, which helps us to accomplish our aims within that time frame, but will it be sustained? Um, and so this balance between when local teams implement in their time frame, in their kind of way, it may take longer and go all kinds of unpredictable directions, but in the end, is that something that's more deeply embedded and integrated and sustained? versus what I call spotlighted efforts where, oh, we're going to get this intervention in and, you know, everyone's on board, executive leaders on down. And there's all of this, it's like a sprint and people can put the time and the energy into it to get it implemented, get it going. But then when the spot, the funding goes away, the attention goes away, the spotlight goes on to something else, what happens to all of that, um, all of that work? Yeah. How do you think we can sustain things? Is it by keeping a sort of team in place like that beyond the funding? Yeah, so that is a challenge. Um, That is a challenge. And um, I'm fortunate we're actually launching a new program in the fall that has a five-year time horizon. So that gives a little bit more kind of luxury, quote unquote, to um, work with teams over a longer period of time. Um, but with the CIFR, so, you know, coming back to the kind of rooting back into the CIFR, what we have found in our studies again and again and again is the inability of frontline clinical teams to, first of all, form as a team, as a, you know, as a, as a high functioning team for the purpose of either quality improvement or implementing change. In my own work, I'm trying to address the root cause of some of our implementation failures. And my suspicion that even when we look successful, that it may not be sustained after we leave. I'm really attempting a fundamental behavior change at the front line and it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's integrating uh, techniques of quality improvement. And this is like intersecting implementation science mm-hmm. with quality improvement. Yeah. And that is a powerful combination because implementation science kind of in an ideal sense has knowledge of evidence-based science or evidence-based uh, interventions and practices that actually work and knowledge of context and can help assist teams to tailor and adapt strategies and the intervention itself. But if we don't have those receptive teams at the front line, that's where a lot of the struggle is. And what I'm finding as a researcher, as an implementation researcher, is that 
we're trying to implement improvements, implement change, implement interventions in systems that just don't have that absorptive capacity. And it is a universal problem where clinicians are A number one focused on treating patients. And any time out of the clinic is considered wasted time almost. I saw a media uh, release once uh, that on our system, about our system and kind of framing it as a, as a not a good thing where, um, well, primary care um, physicians are spending X percent in quote unquote administration. Yeah. And when that starts looking like a bad thing, wow, any time out of the clinic is wasted time. That means that clinicians cannot engage in improvement activities because the pressures are too great. There was a very large uh, quality improvement collaborative trial that was published in Lancet last year uh, that involved over 90 hospitals in England. And one of, their, or one of the commentaries kind of had a concluding statement saying, um, what we learned in all this is that clinicians are too busy treating patients to be able to engage in improvement. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, kind of address those root dynamics of engaging leaders in meaningful ways, building teams, building coalitions to create a more receptive environment or context for, you know, implementation more broadly. But also in any of our, our implementations, we're actually kind of combining use of the dynamic sustainability framework by um, Chambers, um, Stange, and Russ Glasgow um, that, is a, that really centers on cycles of plan, do, study, act. So engaging teams in incremental cycles of change and they're responding and continuing to optimize the intervention over time and as context changes over time, that they continue to be engaged and continue to optimize. And that's where my focus is going, which makes, makes it much more difficult to kind of chop out specific mechanisms. What you're describing is the real life context is a team of people with competing demands in a constantly changing situation. And perhaps a way forward is keep evolving with these PDSA cycles so that are actually keeping it in place. Right. And, and not just keeping it in place, but continuing to optimize it. Of course. So it actually changes over time, just like anything that's alive will it will grow and evolve. It's seeing it in that way rather than perhaps a, a more me mechanistic way where it's like, well, it's in place, that cog's in place, it's done. But whereas actually, you know, this is a living thing. It's, right. it's evolving. I, I guess more, more broadly, um, when we think about the increasing burnout among clinicians and, and how much of that burnout is a result of kind of disempowerment and the potential for allowing, allowing, encouraging, investing in this capacity to engage in change in an ongoing way, and how that not only helps us to accomplish our clinical goals, but also has benefits, longer term benefits for our clinicians. And if our clinicians are less burned out and more engaged and empowered and have agency, then how much better their interactions are with patients, which, you know, then it, it, it creates a virtuous cycle. I did, I did wonder, actually, um, just quick, just briefly, kind of what, what the biggest barriers have, have been uh, in your, you know, in your implementation efforts over the years. Well, the biggest barriers are really in engaging the sites, you know, so we'll say, oh, we're going to implement X, Y, you know, intervention X in 10 clinics. And it's getting engagement from those clinics because they're dealing with, you know, staff vacancies and unexpected turnover and uh, other priorities, you know, competing priorities. It is such a wonderful experience to work with people who are really engaged and passionate and just, you know, really dedicated to making it happen, true champions. But there are also, you know, too many settings where 
the challenges are just um, are, are huge. And um, it really is a challenge for us as implementation researchers to engage and um, keep them engaged. I would say the other thing is that there aren't enough of us. I get so many requests to collaborate, to you know, give advice and help and mentoring. And um, I'm spread, and, and the people that I know that have been in this for a while, we're all spread really thin. So we need to continue um, building capacity in this expertise. Um, and we have a long ways to go in the science. So there's plenty of um, room for, you know, in the world for continuing to advance the science in all kinds of different ways. And then lastly, it's um, continuing to fund, you know, recognizing and knowing where those sources of funding are, whether it's from systems or public funding foundations, that continues always to be a challenge. And one more thing, being able to have the flexibility to evolve and, you know, that time frame is a big issue. And I understand from the funding perspective, well, we can commit three years worth of funding, but we also somehow need to recognize that the realities on the ground are that three years may not be enough. It sounds like a terrible long time, but in reality, somehow three years has gone like that, and we may or may not be successful in that time frame. So I think we need to pay a lot more attention to the sustainment and the absorptive capacity of teams to be able to do that optimization that I talked about earlier. All right, Laurie. Thank okay. you. So that was Laura Damschroeder. Hope you enjoyed the interview and hope to see you at the next one. Thank you very much.